you. Yeah. It's always fun for me to come do a, a course like this for the San Lucia Conservancy and the San Lucia Preserve members. It's, it's always a pleasure. So I'm going to ask each of you to put your mute button on. Um, I see that everybody's doing that. That's great. Just so there's not too much background noise while we're working through this, uh, this lecture. Um, I'm uh, an associate director of conservation for the Big Sur Land Trust. Uh, 20 years ago, I worked for the Land Trust and was the conservation director, but stepped away and worked for another land trust, the Wilderness Land Trust for a number of years, managing the California program and doing land acquisition. And at the same time was hired by CSUMB where I taught for the last 15 years. I taught a really fun class called California Ecosystems, which was fundamental plant identification and then talking about vegetation communities throughout the state, kind of along a transect across the state. And what I'm gonna do now is share my screen with all of you and go through a PowerPoint presentation that's gonna involve at the beginning, looking at some of the resources that you can tap into for your own edu education, for your own work, uh, just your own pleasure loving plants and try to get you guys enthused about going outdoors. I know during COVID it's kind of a challenge, but you have a wonderful, property in your backyard to go and explore and look at plant communities and start identifying plants and just groove on how cool they are because they're all so unique and clearly I'm an enthusiast. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to share my screen and we'll go to the PowerPoint presentation here and I'm going to move all of you over and I'm gonna try and expand the presentation, but you guys will then go away. So I won't be able to see you wave your hands and I won't see the chat box for questions. So if you have questions, please hold on to those until the very end or, or put them in the chat box and I'll try to address those towards the end. Um, and sometimes this messes up. So if it does, I'll uh, reboot. And uh, Lindsay, I'll wait for you to tell me that you can see this whole screen. Can you do that? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, terrific. All right. Well, the next four Tuesday evenings, uh, we're going to chat about different aspects of flowering plants. And notice that I've titled this Basic Plant ID in Santa Lucia Preserve flowering plants, not just wildflowers, because trees and shrubs and all kinds of things produce flowers besides wildflowers that we typically think of in the spring as coming up. Poppies and lupin and phacelias and cryptanthas and popcorn flowers, that kind of thing that bring color to the landscape. But there are all kinds of flowering things that we can delight in, you know, oso berries, which is a kind of a shrub, or bay trees, a tree that is a flowering plant. So we're gonna, you know, talk about the gamut of those things. Tonight, we're gonna talk uh, briefly about plant characteristics, structures of leaves and flowers. And this is sort of the sciencey part of this. And it can be overwhelming, but without the background, without the foundational understanding of what you're looking at and what tools you use to identify plants, uh, without having that foundational background, it's kind of a mystery. You just look at the colors and you groove on that, you delight in that. But if you want to really learn how to identify plants, you need that sciencey background. We'll also, uh, towards the beginning, talk about references. And I will click on some of the, uh, the links I've provided and we'll go through those websites, looking at some of the things that are available to you to help you learn, to help you identify tools that can assist you when you're in the field. Then next week, we're gonna talk about uh, nomenclature and why plants are named the way they are. 
We'll talk about plant families, the fundamental groupings of plants and why they're grouped into families. We'll talk about the characteristics of those families, which will help you uh, learn how to make those finer identifications. And then we'll kind of move into thinking about different habitat types. And I like to think about habitat types, vegetation types, collections of plants that are indicative of certain environments. Because if you are in a particular environment in an environmental context, like a redwood forest, you can almost predict what plants you're gonna find. Or if you are in a coastal grassland, you're almost gonna be able to guess what types of plants and flowering plants you might see. So we'll talk about the habitat perspective and then the following uh, lecture really focus in on plants that are indicative of certain vegetation types, certain local habitats. And then the final lecture, uh, finish up, uh, bring in a conversation about some of the species we might see after fires. And this year might be an incredible year to go botanizing as long as we get a little rain, so cross your fingers. And then if there's time, we'll talk about some of the things that you can find in your backyard that you can work with, either eat or use as a dye or as a fiber. So foraging in your backyard for things that are useful potentially to you. All right. So great websites and references. Hmm. I'm gonna start with looking at the California Native Plant Society, CNPS, at the Monterey Bay chapter of the California Native Plant Society. There are, oh my gosh, a lot of different chapters throughout the state. And the focus, hopefully it'll work. Yep, the focus of the Native Plant Society is to conserve and educate about native plants. The, the the browser window didn't open up. We just see the first page of your presentation. Oh, oh darn. Oh, because I have to share the screen. I just, how oh, bummer. Um, okay, thank you. I will actually uh, stop the share. I wonder how I can do that. Um, hmm. Well, maybe we won't do, maybe I'll let you guys do all that. <laughs> yeah, or I can try and... Uh, let me want to put the links in the chat. Um, that way people can save them and I'll post the um, PowerPoint uh, probably more quickly than I'll post the video. Um, so they'll be available there too. Yeah, okay, here's the, uh, the link to the, um, uh, all right, let's see. So do you see that the uh, PowerPoint right now? Oh, dang. No, you're no longer sharing screen. Okay, let's see. Oh, there's always a, a, a Zoom challenge, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, let's see. There we go. Okay. Are you seeing my screen right now, Lindsay? I see your PowerPoint presentation. Yes, okay. Well, I will put these links not in the chat, but I will let you uh, work with those on your own when you get either the video or the uh, PDF, uh, and I will send the PDF to Lindsay uh, this evening when we're done. So anyway, all these different um, websites are informational sources that you can tap into. This first one here, the California Native Plant Society, Monterey Bay chapter, has links to the books that you might find useful books that could help you um, get really serious about it, uh, books that focus on very technical aspects of the plants in Monterey County, uh, or books like the, the uh, reference Lindsay suggested earlier, The Wildflowers of Monterey County by Rod Yeager and Michael Mitchell. That one is a color-coded guide to wildflowers that is organized around plant families. That's why we're gonna spend so much time on families next week. Because if you understand family structures, 
then you're going to know exactly where to go first in the plant guides to get you the information you want to know right away. It's a, just a, a good framework for organizing your thoughts. Now, on the Monterey Bay CMPS website is a click on link to plant lists for local places, all kinds of local places you might go, parks, uh, destination points, um, even you know trails in the Ventana Wilderness and the Los Padres National Forest. So plant lists for local places. And those of you who become more serious about plant ID, you know, what am I going to see when I go to Andrew Malera State Park? Well, you can go to the Monterey Bay Chapters website, click on the local plants tab, find the plant lists section and download a plant list for Andrew Malera State Park. You know, it may not be 100% complete, but it's probably got most of the things that you'll see. So it's a really useful aid in um, helping you figure out what you're looking at. Now this book here, Monterey, or excuse me, this website, montereywildflowers.com is actually produced by one of the authors of the book, Monterey Wildflowers. And it's phenomenal. It's like mind blowing. It's got indices for scientific names, common names. It's all organized by color, but it's also organized by family and species. So just spend some time playing with that and you'll, you'll unleash this treasure trove of incredible useful information. And the flower photographs are exquisite. Uh, Michael Mitchell was a, a very um, talented photographer, actually a retired British tax attorney of all things, who started taking photographs and started looking at flowers through the lens of his camera and realized he didn't know anything about plants. And through his photographs actually became quite an accomplished botanist to the point where he wrote several books. Uh, I'm sorry that he actually moved back to England last summer. So he's no longer a resident of Monterey County. He's left us though with this incredible legacy of, of useful information. Now these are, these are two other websites, Calflora, uh, a little bit more technical one. Um, if you want very specific information about plants and where they occur throughout the state, herbarium records, you can go to this website. This one, plantnet.org is a useful plant ID tool. Um, you type in it's green or it's white and it has five petals and it has a yellow center and I found it in a redwood forest. All these different characteristics and it will hone in gradually on what you might be seeing. All right, now there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos and podcasts that are incredibly useful if you wanna go there. Uh, there's some of them are really entertaining. One of my favorites is Ecosystems of California by Erica Zavaleta, a Stanford University professor. YouTube videos that focus on different habitat types or different ecosystems. And again, that's how I like to organize my thinking around looking and identifying for particular plants. Once you know the environmental context and you understand what the habitat is, you are 10 steps ahead to identifying what the plants are inside those habitats. Ethnobotanical Uses of California Plants, another YouTube site with lots of interesting things. A podcast that I really, really like. Hundreds of interviews in defense of plants, sometimes highly scientific, sometimes more philosophical, but really, really interesting. And then this one, <laughs> crime pays, but botany doesn't. <laughs> This one's kind of goofy. Um, the gentleman who, who hosts this has really bad language, I just gotta say. He uses a lot of swear words, you know, he's sort of off color sometimes. He's an Italian fellow that has a very colorful way of speaking, but he's got really good information 
So if you can kind of tune out the language and focus on what he's saying in terms of the plants and their environment, he's really good. He uses a lot of the technical terms repetitively and they kind of burn into your brain. So if you want a little entertainment <laughs> and tune out the offensive language, he's excellent. He also has podcasts and particularly his interviews are very, very good when he's actually having a dialogue with uh, a famous botanist or a geneticist or a conservationist. So I recommend all those and you can, when you get the PDF, um, sort of search those out on your own. Okay, so let's get into the good stuff. How come it's not advancing? If you put it in the slideshow mode, you'll be able oh, to yeah. advance normally. Let's do that and make the screen nice and big too. Okay, there we go, cool. All right, so here's a California rose, California wild rose. It's beautiful. The petals are soft, pink. Yeah, how do I know this is a California rose? Well, you know, we all know what a rose looks like, right? But to make sure this is a California wild rose, one of our native roses. I need to know, first of all, that it has five petals and not 10. I need to look into the center of the corolla or the collection of petals and look at these structures, which are the stamens. The stamen is composed of the filament the skinny little thing and the anther, the pollen holding part. These are male plant parts. In the center are the female plant parts. The stigma, which collects the pollen, moves it down through the style to the ovary where the seeds are developed. Okay, now this is a vocabulary overload already. Oh my God, don't freak out about all these terms because once you become more familiar with them, they become part of your lexicon, part of the language that you use to describe what you see. So we all know what a hand is, right? Well, a hand is like a flower. A hand is composed of multiple parts. We have the palm, we have a thumb, an index finger, we have knuckles. The bones are what, metatarsals, I think. We have a wrist. And then if we wanna get really into it, we have a lot of different bones in the wrist at the top of the hand. We have fingernails and cuticles. We have wrinkles that, you know, are indicative of certain things if you believe in palm reading. So these are familiar terms to us that describe a hand. We all know what an arm is. An arm has a hand, a wrist, a forearm, an elbow, a shoulder. The same can be said for plants. We all know this is a flower, right? But it's composed of different parts. It's composed of petals, stamens, anthers, filaments, a Stigma style ovary. Ooh, and what about the parts that are a little bit less visible? Over here where my mouse is, this sort of cool, acute triangular shape is part of what we call the calyx. What's a calyx? It's composed of sepals. Oh my God, term overload, right? You know, the sepals and the calyx enclose the bud. When the calyx opens, the sepals separate to expose the flower. Just like when our wrist is closed and we open our hands, we expose the fingers. So learning these terms at first is overwhelming. It's a term nightmare, but you shouldn't be uh, afraid of this, it just takes time to become familiar with it. So plant parts in the flower 
are diagnostic. They tell me this is a California wild rose. It has a lot of stamens. It has multiple stigmas in the middle. Those are diagnostic of the California wild rose and maybe not of the pine rose or the wood rose. So there are species differences. The same can be said for leaf parts. Leaf parts are diagnostic. Here are the leaves of the California wild rose. They're compound leaves, one, two, three, four, five, six, together on one long attachment. But look at how the edges are serrated. This is a technical term, believe it or not, serrated like a bread knife, a serrated knife. It has a mid vein. It has a structure that's pinnate. All these terms are diagnostic of the leaves of a California wild rose. Okay, here's a mind blowing thing. There's a ton of different leaf shapes, right? A ton of them. You kind of look at this and you go, oh yeah, I've seen those things, but you didn't know they all had names, right? Things are sword shaped or they're ob lanceolate or they're pinnate or they're opposite. It's like, okay, oh my God, <laughs> brain, brain overload. Don't be deterred. After a while, these become familiar, but you don't need to know them all because there are tools to help you. Look at all these different leaf shapes. Now, lanceolate, here's a willow, a willow that you might find on the San Lucia Preserve in a riparian habitat or a wet area where the soil stays moist continuously it has lanceolate shaped leaves. That's kind of a lance shaped leaf, kind of like a sword. Now, what about this one? Here's a, another species that is oval, all right? Oval, well, here's an oval shape. Now these are ovate. How do I know these are ovate and not oval? Here's an ovate one. Well, it's ever so slightly wider on the bottom. All right, these are subtle differences, subtle differences. And no, you don't have to remember all this stuff because there are tools, there are diagrams, and there are books like this one, which is one of my favorites, Plant Identification Terminology. That's an illustrated glossary. And if you get serious about plants, I recommend you purchase this. It is a treasure trove of information. It has definitions and diagrams for all these crazy terms. Now, I don't know how to move this. Um, is this bar in the way for you guys? I don't know how to move that bar out of the way. No, but, we can see a list of words here. Yeah, okay, Under, underneath that bar, all these, this list of, of words is uh, describing surfaces of leaves. Surfaces of leaves, oh my God, there's, I don't know, 20, there's 30, there's more that I didn't include, and they're crazy. Aculeate, I mean, that's a crazy word for prickly. Or aculeolate, minutely prickly. These are very specific. You know, what's the difference between prickly and armed? Something with thorns, spines, barbs, or prickles. I mean, these are really subtle differences. But what's really cool about this book is that they have diagrams inside that actually help you tease out those subtle differences. So I start a few that I have diagrams for that I just copied right out of the book. Crinite with tufts of long, soft hairs. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the surface of a leaf and you see these tufts of long, fine hairs, you're looking at something that's crinite. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters if you are really into trying to identify the subtleties between different plant species. Some might have crinite surfaces on their leaves, and some might have 
flocos surfaces on their leaves. It's subtly different. What does sock flocos mean? It means tufts of long tangled hairs. Not tufts of long soft hairs, but tangled hairs. <laughs> it's very subtle, isn't it? You mean it's gonna feel soft to you probably. Um, what's the difference between something that's flocos and papillate? Well, what's papillate mean? It means having papillae. What are papillae? They're like little bumps. You know, all these things are going to factor into making definitive plant identifications because botanists have this rich, complicated terminology for describing very subtle things. So to even see these subtle things, you need to have a hand lens. And if you really get into botany, I recommend you purchase a hand lens. It don't cost much, maybe $25, sometimes less, that you can look up close and personal on the surfaces of things inside the center of a flower, look at the structure of the stigma uh, to really make a definitive positive identification. But the terms are really mind blowing. Um, you don't need to memorize any of this stuff. There are tools like this plant identification terminology book that I carry with me in my backpack whenever I go botanizing because I don't remember all these terms. But you need to have at least access to something like that to make the definitive ID. Okay, so here we are looking at the fundamental shape and type of leaves. You know, I recommend you go outside. It's too dark now, tomorrow, unless it's raining. We'll go anyway, go in the rain. And look at a bunch of plants. I mean, just look at them and, and absorb the differences. So here's an oak tree, a coast live oak, like we have all around us. It is a simple leaf. It's one single solitary leaf. Right? One single solitary leaf. It has a vein pattern, right? It has a interesting margin. And if you know the margin of oak leaves, you know it has little prickles around the edge. It has what's called a petiole that attaches it to a stem. Now this one's ever so slightly different because it has this thing called a stipule. Look at, here's the stipule over here on a willow. I bet you've never looked up close and personal at a willow leaf to see that it has this little funny fleshy appendage at the base of the petiole. Well, if you're looking closely at plants and you wanna make a positive ID, you need to really get in there and look. Now, what about this leaf here? Look at how it attaches right to the stem. It's sessile. There's no little petiole, no little tiny stemlet that attaches it. It's, it's like almost clasping, but not as clasping as this one. See how it wraps around is sessile. It's stuck right to the stem, but it kind of wraps around it like this mustard plant. And to know that this is field mustard as opposed to black mustard, as opposed to many of the other mustard invasive plants that occur in Central California, you need to notice this clasping leaf of a simple leaf, a single solitary leaf. Okay, now compare those with what are called compound leaves. Compound leaves, it's not just one leaf together, this is one leaf of like a lupin. Here's a series of lupin leaves. Here's a lupin leaf. This is one leaf. This is one leaf of any kind of pea, like a pea vine or a sweet pea or a bean. This is one leaf of a clover perhaps. This is one leaf. Now, how do I know that? Because these are attached 
to the petiole at a specific place in a certain way, but they don't attach to the stem until the base here at a particular thing called a node. So this is a little complicated. These leaves, like the lupin leaf, are composed of all these individual what are called leaflets. And leaflets can be arranged like this. They can be arranged like this, like this with a little thing at the end here, or like this. Lupins are arranged like, like this with their leaflets arranged in a circular pattern or what we call a palmate pattern like your hand. And beans, there's the Pacific pea, arranged in a way that are pinnate or sort of opposite each other, as opposed to originating at a central point. It's mind blowing, it's complicated. All right, now I don't know what I said under here. Um, oh, this is leaf arrangement. So again, looking up close and personal, leaves can be alternating along a stem or attached in an opposite fashion, or sometimes radiating around a stem like this or whorled. Black sage is a whorled leaf structure. Oregon ash, they're opposite one another. These are individual leaves that attach at a node, yet this whole thing is not a leaf. These are not leaflets, these are individual leaves because they attach at a node. And again, you need to look with your hand lens to see that. There's a branch of a black walnut where the leaves are opposite, but not exactly quite. They're mostly alternating along the stem. So this is probably an overload already, but this is what we start with. This is the sciencey part that helps you with plant identification. And again, there's no need to memorize this or to get blown away by how complex it can be uh, because there are really useful tools that will help you learn this foundational material. And the vein patterns, again, looking up close and personal, here's a midrib of a vein with very specific you know, opposite kinds of patterns. They call this pinnate, similar to a feather on a bird. The structure of a feather on a bird is what we call pinnate. Reticulates are more complex. Palmate, just like your palm again, radiating from a central area where your palm might be. All of these are going different directions. There could be more than five. Now here's an interesting one. This one has three main veins. This is diagnostic of certain Ceanothus species. One of the primary things at the very beginning of identifying Ceanothus in the plant books is, does it have three veins or just one? Just one. And that's diagnostic in looking at the leaves for Ceanothus. Parallel veins. Another very diagnostic feature for plants in the monocot group that are things like grasses and lilies and palms, things that are um, developed early on with one seed leaf, a monocot, uh, have diagnostic parallel veins. So Oak leaves, an example of a pinnate vein arrangement. This is probably a birch leaf, a reticulate kind of vein arrangement. Here's a picture of Cape Ivy, which I hope you don't have on the preserve. It's an invasive non-native from South Africa that has a palmate kind of 
vein structure and also a palmate kind of lobing structure. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Here's a Ceanothus, Ceanothus, Ceanothus thyrsiflorus, one of the more common ones that you probably have on the preserve. It has three very distinctive veins. And English plantain with a parallel kind of vein structure, another non-native kind of weedy thing. So looking more at leaves, oh my gosh, there's margins to think of too. Who knew, you know? an entire margin. There are no bumps or dents or grooves or, or whatever. Notches that can be dentate, like your teeth, or serrate, like a knife, or crenate, kind of smooth and, you know, more bumpy. Lobed, like the valley oak, Quercus lobata, and look, it's even in the scientific name. Quercus lobata has lobed leaves. It, and parted, a little bit more complicated, a little bit harder. This one's very symmetric, often they're not. So you gotta look at the veins, you gotta look at the margins, you gotta look at the arrangement, you gotta look at the overall structure. Same can be true for plant flowers. Plant flowers, the same things like, oh God, this is the term overload and I get it. <laughs> but we're dealing with the science foundational stuff at the beginning here. And it, it is um, challenging to, to absorb all these different characteristics. But again, I encourage you to go out and just look at the cool flowers in your yard. Look at the cool plants that you have on your properties or in garden areas around the hacienda where there are a lot of really neat things to look at. And just start, you know, picking up on the subtleties and recognizing that once you start looking, you see all these differences that are again, diagnostic for identifying plants. So dealing with flower shapes, you know, plant, plants can be tubular. That makes sense, big long tube. Tubes like this are often pollinated by very specific things like hummingbirds, particularly if they're red. So there's often a very close relationship with plant flower shape and pollinators. Here's some tubular flowers of the tree tobacco, Nicotiana, another uh, native to extreme Southern California and Mexico, which is invasive now in, in our region. Campanulate flowers like campana, like a bell, a bell-shaped flower. Lots and lots and lots of bell-shaped flowers around. Particularly, here's a manzanita. Look at those cool flowers. They're bell-shaped, more specifically urn-shaped. And there's a word for that, ursulate, but they're bell-shaped. They hang down, they're campanulate, like a campana, like a bell, campana in Spanish. Now these are pollinated also by very specific things. And I learned recently about a very cool technique that uh, certain bumblebees use. A big bumblebee couldn't get into that tiny opening at the base of the flower to pollinate it. It's just bumblebees too big to get in there and harvest any of the pollen or, or even begin to think about getting close to the pollen source, what it's looking for really. So what they do is they, buzz, they actually flutter their wings at the base of those bell-shaped flowers and they buzz to the tone of middle C on a piano. That's to me incredible. And you can actually take a tuning fork that's tuned to middle C and replicate the buzz pollination technique of the bumblebee who's buzzing at middle C and at that frequency, the pollen releases from the stamens and the anthers, the male pollen parts, the pollen producing parts of the flower, the pollen releases and goes through the opening and that small bell-shaped flower and lands on the bumblebee. That's like incredible to me. <laughs> it's so interesting. So these, these flowers have uh, evolved certain shapes um, in conjunction oftentimes with certain pollinators that use very specific techniques. They've co-evolved like hummingbirds that would 
look to pollinate a long tubular flower like this. Now the California wild rose, far more open, obviously, with a flower shape. It's symmetrical, radially symmetrical, very regular, has a very specific name for that regular, radially symmetrical flower. You can divide it along multiple planes and you'll come up with the exact same symmetry actinomorphic, fancy word for just symmetrical and regular. And then there are more bilaterally symmetrical or irregularly shaped flowers, a zygomorphic, fancy name. They can only be symmetrically divided along one plane. And that's typical of all the monkey flowers, sticky monkey flower, seep spring monkey flower, uh, Crimson monkey flower, all the various different monkey, San Lucia monkey flower, all the different monkey flowers are bilaterally, bilaterally symmetrical with irregular flowers. So that is again, diagnostic of those species of monkey flowers. And then finally, here's another flower shape, more trumpet-like salver form, sort of, you know, descending down into a, more tight tubular form at the base. That's very typical of the um, bindweeds, the morning glories, that kind of thing. And uh, again, very um, diagnostic flower shape of different kinds of species. Ooh, and now let's get serious. <laughs> you didn't think I was serious before. We're getting more and more complex. Um, you can review all these slides help you learn and help you um, sort of appreciate the diversity of, of all these different plants. Um, where are the seeds formed in flowering plants? The seeds are all formed in an ovary and the position of the ovary, the place where the seeds are formed is a diagnostic tool. So here's a California poppy, the seeds are formed above, in the center of the flower, above where it attaches to the stem, all right? You don't see where the seeds are formed. What happens when the seeds are developing, the petals fall off, and you're left with, in the center of the flower, this big old long seed pod where the tiny little black poppy seeds are formed. The ovary, the place where the seeds are formed, is superior. It's above where the petals are attached to the stem. Superior ovaries. Now there's a couple different varieties. Superior ovaries where the seeds are formed attach above where the plant flower attaches to the stem. That's not the same as inferior ovaries. The seeds are formed below where all the petals are. Ooh, okay, the petals, the stamens and the anthers, the male pollen parts and the petals and all the, you know, receptors like the stigma here are above where the seeds are formed. And the best example I could come up with the other day when I was putting this together is like, here's a zucchini, <laughs> not, a, not a California native plant. But here's the zucchini. All the squashes have seeds formed below all the flower parts. This is an inferior ovary. It's inferior. It's below where all the flower parts attach. It's still attached to the stem way down there somewhere, but where the seeds are formed in the ovary, the inferior ovary is below all these flower parts. All squashes are like that. Okay, now we've talked about flowers and their shapes, some of their parts, where the ovaries are, are positioned. Now, those are all referring to single flowers. But Many, many, many things we see in nature are not just single flowers, they're actually collections of flowers. Collections of flowers called an inflorescence. So sometimes there's just one single flower, 
at the top of a stem. That's a solitary flower. Sometimes there are multiple flowers along a stem arranged like that. This is a collection of flowers. It's not just one, it's a collection. It's an inflorescence. And true to botanists, they have names for all these inflorescences, all these collections of flowers. This one's a raceme. The flowers are collected along the stem in a pattern like that. Here's a panicle. It's like, oh my God, it's a panic of flowers. There are multiple branches that each have flowers. Collectively, this inflorescence is called a panicle. Here's a collection of flowers in inflorescence where the oldest flowers are on the end of these little stems. Here's a inflorescence where the collection of flowers, the youngest ones are on the end and the oldest ones in the middle. Now here's a fun one. This is easier to understand. This is a collection of flowers and inflorescence called an umbel, like an umbrella. Think about all the various spines in an umbrella. They all originate at a common point. When you open your umbrella, all of the stays that hold up what's kept keeping you wet, or I mean, not, not from getting wet, keeping you dry or keeping you out of the sun perhaps, all those originate at a common point. So let's look at some. Here's an inflorescence. This whole thing is a collection of individual blossoms. This is one flower on an inflorescence that has the name of a sign. The youngest um, flowers at the bottom. The oldest flower is at the top. When this one dies back, then the next one will flower. Then the next one down below. Then the next one down below. These are the youngest buds down here. This inflorescence is characteristic of this particular plant, uh, Cystanthe. I have these in my garden and they're, they're really pretty. Now here's another inflorescence that some of you may be more familiar with. This is an umbel. All the individual flowers here in the umbel inflorescence. This is a yarrow, a common yarrow that many of us have in our gardens. There's yellow ones, there's pink ones, there's you know magenta ones, a lot of different horticulturally available yarrows. This is the, uh, the originating native uh, from which all the horticultural selections have been made. Yarrow is typically white or ye yellow uh, on the east side of the Sierra, the sulfur buckwheat, or excuse me, the, the well, I'm thinking of a buckwheat, but there are yellow ones. Um, the collection of each little individual flower is comprising this umbel inflorescence. Yarrow is also really intriguing to me because it has a leaf, this is one leaf. It's a linear shape, a linear shape, but it's highly dissected into these very fine feather-like forms. It's a diagnostic feature of the yarrow. And here's the most complicated flower. The most complicated of all, you know, daisies, the sunflowers, they're not complicated. What's she talking about? <laughs> but this is not just a single flower. This is an inflorescence. Daisies and sunflowers and asters and thistles, artichokes, dandelions are all part of a family called the Asteraceae. And unfortunately you can't see it probably underneath my screen share here, but the Asteraceae named after the most diagnostic member of that family, the aster, are all composed of inflorescences. This is one inflorescence. It's a compound flower or a composite flower. Each individual ray can be one flower. 
each individual disc floret inside the center can be one flower. If you look in cross section, if you took a, a sunflower and you broke it open, something big that you could look at, you could see the ray florets or the ray flowers ending at a single seed. She loves me, she loves me not, right? She loves me, she loves me not. Each one of those can be attached to a single seed. It is a flower that has an ovary where a seed is made, in this case, one single seed. Think about eating sunflowers. That's what you're eating, is the seed of a member of the Asteraceae from a composite flower. Usually, um, members of the Asteraceae, usually the center florets each individual little flower in this composite structure produces a single seed. Think about eating those sunflowers. There they are developing all those little tiny things down there. <laughs> yeah. And in side view, here are the ray florets. And what's holding them are very specific structures called the phyleries, or some people call them the filleries. And again, each part of this is diagnostic to certain species of the Asteraceae. Sometimes the phyleries or the filleries are, you know, rimmed with black like this one. Sometimes they curve over and are diagnostic of a different kind of species. Sometimes there's multiple rows like this kind of arranged like shingles overlapping one another. And sometimes they're all nicely marching around the plant like a little line of soldiers, individually noticeable. So again, very diagnostic features that help you identify specifically what plant you're looking at, but you gotta get down in there looking carefully and closely and appreciating the differences and seeing the subtleties recognizing that there are colors and shapes and, and features that are specific to you know, individual plants. And then finally, this might be my last slide, um, looking at other kinds of composite flowers that are more complicated yet are familiar to you. Dandelions are composite flowers. They don't have the structures that we recognize in a daisy, you know, with the, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me. The ray flowers or the ray florets that we can pluck off, they have a different kind of structure. Still, these are composite flowers. This, what I'm circling is the inflorescence of the dandelion. It's the collection of individual flowers. When the dandelion matures, down here, the florets that all end at a single seed, when they mature, each individual seed is attached to one of these little, you know, parachute kind of things. And that again is diagnostic of a whole suite of plants in the Asteraceae family. Same with thistles. You guys all know what thistles are. You have an aggressive anti-thistle weed eradication program on a, on a preserve. You have staff that go out there and fight those invasive thistles. Why? Because they take over native habitat to the detriment of native plants and wildlife species, pollinators, birds, insects, all kinds of things. Here is a milk thistle from an herbarium um, mount, as is the dandelion here. I really like her bearing mounts. They're sort of artistic and, and very neat to look at. It has typical composite type flowers, even though it doesn't look quite like a daisy. Each individual floret ending at a single seed, a single ovary. This is a complicated parted leaf. And if we could look real close, the stem would have prickles on it. There's probably a far more technical term to define those prickles for the thistles, but you wouldn't notice that and you went, until you went to hold it or until you went to look at it carefully and appreciate how 
individually unique that particular thistle is. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Hopefully I didn't lose too many people with all the sciencey stuff, <laughs> but that's how we have to start. It's the foundation, learning that there are these terms. The terms don't have to be onerous to learn because you have tools that can help you. You have the glossary, you have definitions, you have pictures, but you got to learn to appreciate that each individual plant has characteristics that make it what it is, that make it diagnostic, that make it special. And you have to learn to appreciate that and get up, look close. If you have a hand lens, terrific. If you don't, just put a plant in the middle of your you know, sphere of view and get parallax on it so you, you don't go cross-eyed. So you can really get down and get close and personal to really appreciate what you're looking at. Okay, just a couple minutes if anybody has questions, I do see in the chat, let's see. Share my whole window. Ooh, that's crazy cool about the bumblebees. Yes, it is. <laughs> I agree. And I want to try it. You can do it with like tomatoes also. Apparently, if you take a middle C tuning fork or you kind of make a sound at middle C, tomatoes will release their pollen. You can hold a piece of paper under them and actually catch the pollen. It's pretty cool. Anyway. All right, anybody have other questions? You're welcome to turn your video on and wave your arm or... or um, uh, Ellie has a question, go for it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so just since we're in the technical weeds anyway. Um, yes. I was wondering how fillaries are different than sepals. Oh, good question. Um, fillaries are specific to the Asteraceae. Okay, it is the sepal, but it's the specific name of the sepal for the Asteraceae, for the composite flowers. Yeah, and for those of you that the sepals are part of the calyx that holds the bud, and when the calyx opens to reveal the flower, the little parts that used to hold the bud together separate into the sepals. So it's the same for the compositi, but the specific sepal is the fillery, or some people say filary. I use both. Yeah. Question, yes. Vivian, unmute. There you go. Hi, hi. Thank, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Just, you know, my background is actually a picture taken from uh, Williams Canyon Trail. Oh, cool. Um, so with the loop, the sky loop in. Get yeah close and look at those now. <laughs> yeah, well, so, so now I'm, what I'm glad, since we're starting to get really nitty gritty here, what's yeah. the difference between a bract and some of the, you know, filary that you're talking about that hold the bud in place before it blossoms? How do you tell the difference? Yes. That's a very good question and it's really confusing. Um, bracts are technically modified leaves, okay? Whereas the sepals and the calyx are technically part of the flower. It's a fine line. So does the bract have its own node then in order to distinguish where it attaches to the stem? Not, no, not necessarily. So if you think of a sunflower, um, it's a really, the sunflower is held in this sort of rim of green bracts, which are kind of modified leaves but it also has filaries or fillaries as a next layer inside that, which are part of the inflorescence. In this case, the inflorescence of the composite. It's a- The differentiation is easiest to see once the flower has bloomed. Yes, yes, because your calyx that separates into the sepal would be part of the flower actually. Whereas the bracts, the bracts can be right below that, but they're, sort of almost modified leaves. Got it, thank you. Most a part of the flower structure. Thank you. Yeah, and it's subtle, but yeah, nitty gritty. <laughs> I love it. Cool. All right, well, good. First- Hi. Uh, yes, oh you? yes, Alessandra, please. Yes, hi, nice to meet you. Um, is this just sort of a broad overview to get us started and then we'll talk about um, wildflowers that we can find within the preserves? Yes, oh, okay. definitely. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. 
with like an overload of flower pictures coming up. <laughs> okay. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. But the way I'm going to organize the flower pictures is more um, around the habitats. So when you go, say, into a grassland, these are the things that you might see. Or a woodland, these are the things that you might find. So okay. yeah, more ready to, um, to appreciate them. Yeah. Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you. Cool. All right. Any more questions or are we good for tonight?